tonight's session is called Human Rights Goes to the Movies. Human Rights Cinema and the Drama of Truth and Rights. Now, as you can guess from the title, there is not going to be much law in this. So, sit back and enjoy a talk about film and human rights, and about the relationship between cinema and human rights. There will, of course, be some relation to law, and I'll talk about where that is later in the session. But what I want you to do for the moment is just go with me on this little journey that explores the connection between human rights and cinema, and hopefully along the way, you should understand some aspects about what we mean by human rights in a different way. So the purpose of tonight's class is not just to show you some clips, which I will do of course, but also to try to make you think about human rights in more challenging ways. Now, I uh, I'm the director of Centre for Human Rights in Conflict at the University of East London. And we do work on a whole range of different kinds of human rights projects around the world. Uh, but one of the things we've become interested in recently is uh, human rights cinema and human rights film and the, the role that human the film can play in promoting human rights projects. And so that's really what got me into this uh, area to look at the, the connection between cinema and human rights in a little bit of a deeper way. Okay, before we start, however, before we start talking about cinema, let's talk a little bit about human rights. Marion, could I have the next slide there? I want to talk about human rights, what we mean by human rights because we use the phrase all the time. In fact, I would say we use the phrase too much without usually understanding what it means or where it comes from. The other night, I was walking home in London and I saw a couple arguing or fighting. The woman was upstairs at the balcony, the man was downstairs by his car, shouting at each other, right? She's shouting, you're never coming back here again. And the man's saying, I've got to go up there, I've got to kill you. And, and she says, you can't say that to me. It's against my human rights. And he says, your human rights? What about my human rights? And so they were screaming at each other on the street about human rights. It's in East London, Romeo and Juliet. And I was struck by it because as I saw them, I realized, Human rights is just one of these words we use to describe, nowadays we use to describe anything that we think is, is right or correct. But we very rarely explore the phrase and explore where the phrase comes from or what it means. A part of tonight's event is that I want to talk a little bit about the history of human rights and where cinema fits into that history. Because human rights is not just about people saying what belongs to them, or people expressing their rights. Human rights is much more than that. It's a way of thinking. And it's a way of thinking that has come to dominate pretty much all ethical thinking about politics and law. When we talk about human rights, we can be talking about anything. We can be talking about women's rights, we can be talking about poverty, we can be talking about war, we could be talking about war crimes or genocide. We could be talking about water rights. We could be talking about cultural rights. But it's come to dominate our political and legal field in a way that is more effective than any other single concept I can think of in the modern age. Everyone thinks they understand what is meant by human rights but very few people actually stand back and think about the history of the concept itself. We also are so used to talking about human rights that we forget 
That's a very modern idea. It's a very recent development. If you were to speak to someone 50 years ago about human rights, what do you think about human rights? They would look at you blankly. What do you think about human rights? This is a new phrase. We've forgotten that. We've forgotten that this is the phrase that up until the uh, 1940s, late 1940s, was unknown. It had been used in a few documents in the 1920s and 30s, but unless you were a very dedicated legal scholar, you wouldn't have known what it meant. This is a phrase that has a history, and it's important to think about and to understand what that history is. The history really comes out of the 1940s. To understand where human rights come from, you've got to go back to the period from 1946 to 49. And it's in that period that the concept of human rights emerges onto the world stage for the first time. That's how recent. Now just imagine, that's not that long ago, really. And in between 1949 and now, this phrase, human rights, has come to dominate political, ethical, and legal discourse. That's extraordinary. In fact, in some of my writing, I describe it as a global theology. It's a global theology in the sense that it seems to represent a set of values that are sometimes appear to be beyond question. They shouldn't be beyond question, but I think they are. What are, a source, what are the sources of human rights? Well, look, there are two elements to this. I mentioned here humanity plus rights. Think about the two aspects of the word human rights, human and rights. Why the connection between human and rights, and where does that come from? Well, it comes from the post-war Nuremberg trials, and also from international humanitarian law. I'll tell you why in a moment. After the Second World War, the world was confronted with what was the largest single act of human barbarity in our short history as a species, and that was the, the Holocaust in Europe, which was the uh, targeting of, well, it's not exactly how many, but between six and seven million people um, who were targeted and they were, uh, were murdered because of their ethnic origin. Now, uh, in that group, we had Jews, we had Roman Gypsies, um, we had many Slavs as well. Uh, also targeted were homosexuals, disabled people, Jehovah's Witnesses. This was a calamity that did not belong and does not belong to any one group in particular. But it was a singular act of barbarity. It was carried out in the 19th 30s and 40s by the most advanced state on the planet at that time, which was Germany. So trying to get our heads around that in the 1940s was pretty difficult. And how the world should respond to the most advanced country in the world exterminating millions of people, it created something of a crisis in modern philosophy, modern ethics, and modern law. And out of that crisis comes human rights. I'll tell you why. Let's look at the two elements of human rights. Let's look at the second element first, rights. Rights are not a new concept. You can think right back to, let's say, the American Bill of Rights, of 1776. We can think back to um, the French Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen of 1789, and multiple other declarations of rights around the world. And you could say that Western political philosophy has been obsessed with rights. Yeah, the social contract, for example, 
is based on the rights that an individual has as a member of a political society. But the point about rights is that they only make sense within a political society, within a state. Historically, the concept of rights was about entitlements that an individual has as a member of a society, as a subject of a state. Now, who gives you the rights? State gives you the rights. State gives you that space of individual liberty in relation to which you can live your life with a certain amount of freedom. Call that space of individual liberty rights. Who gives it? State gives it. So historically, in Western political thought, the concept of rights was tied up with the state. However, what happened in Nazi Germany? Well, in Nazi Germany, the most advanced state in the world dealt with this in a very simple way. They simply said, people who are not Aryan, whatever that means, people who are not determined by the state to be racially pure, were simply no longer citizens. And because they were no longer citizens, all of those protections of rights didn't apply. So you could take a whole part of the population and you could say, well, they're not citizens anymore. So rights don't apply to them. The rest of the population has rights, but they don't. So disabled people, for example, were stripped of their citizenship. Jews were stripped of their citizenship. And then, of course, you could remove them from their jobs, uh, you could remove them from their houses, and eventually kill them. So rights didn't provide an answer. The second source that we should think about of human rights is the concept of humanity. This concept of humanity is largely derived from international humanitarian law in the 1940s, from the idea of um, legal entitlements that every individual has by virtue of being a human being. By international humanitarian law, by the 1940s, we're talking about a small number of conventions, things like the Hague Convention, uh, the, sorry, the Hague Regulations, the Geneva Convention, limitations on uh, states from using force in relation to civilians and prisoners. Okay? But they're the only legal instruments that we had at that time that talked about the human. So, international humanitarian law gave people protection not on the basis of their citizenship, or membership of the state, but by virtue of the fact that they were human. So, a prisoner in international humanitarian law couldn't be shot because, not because they're a member of the state, but because they're a human being. So, what we have in the post-Second World War period, 1946-49, we have a conjunction of these two ideas, the idea of the human and the idea of rights. And the idea was that if you put these two concepts together, you might be able to create a legal framework that would prevent what happened in Nazi Germany from happening again. So if you want to understand human rights now, You've got to look back to 1946 to 49 to understand how the world dealt with the aftermath of Nazi Germany. And it's because of that aftermath that those two phrases, the human and rights, are put together. Before that, they were in different baskets. They really had very little to do with each other. Uh, so for example, the Nuremberg trials were confronted with this problem. The Germans said, the Nazis who were put on trial said that they were following orders. They were doing what they were obliged to do. And the uh, extermination of millions of people, um, it was lawful. It was lawful. These people were not citizens, and this extermination was permitted under Germany. 
So at the Nuremberg Tribunals, the concept of human rights still hadn't emerged. So they found other concepts to develop, such as the concept of um, crimes against humanity, and so on. And it's not until the 1949 Universal Declaration of Human Rights that we find any coherent definition of human rights. That's really the first human rights document, 1949. Before that, there is nothing. There is no human rights document until the Universal Declaration. That's why the Universal Declaration is so important. If you want to understand where human rights comes from, look at the history of this declaration. And in fact, for me, the whole history of both international law and international human rights law, 1946 to 49, is the most interesting period. Because most of our current human rights concepts come from that moment. What happens after 1949? Why does it all stop? Well, it stops because of the Cold War. 1949, of course, the world divides into two mutually opposed blocks, into the Soviet bloc and the Western states. They both have different conceptions of human rights. The Western states say that human rights are about individual freedom, things like a right to liberty, a right to a fair trial, a right to freedom of religion, freedom of expression. And the Soviet countries say, well, in order to have all those rights, individual rights, you've got to have social and economic rights. Things like a right to work, a right to health care, a right to um, a clean environment, uh, a right to education, and so on. You've got two completely opposed versions of human rights competing with each other between 1949 and, I suppose, 1990. In 19, well, what happened in 1990? Cold War ends. Cold War ends. And so the, uh, if you like, this blockage that had occurred in human rights thinking since 1949 comes to an end. Uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, the president of the Soviet Union, very famously in 1989, said the 1990s would be the decade of human rights. I didn't realize it would not be the decade of the Soviet Union. But from 1990 onwards, human rights just expand exponentially. I mean, we now assume that human rights have been everywhere forever. It hasn't. It's really since 1990 that the United Nations has incorporated human rights into every single document it produces. We've seen human rights referred to in security council resolutions. Uh, we've seen the volume of human rights initiatives uh, from the United Nations, again, increase exponentially. Pretty much every policy intervention of the United Nations is framed now in terms of human rights. And that is since the end of the Cold War. That's why I say this is a global theology. This is a way of thinking that is almost impossible in any practical or political way to, to contest. Okay, well, that's our background. That's where we're beginning. We're beginning from the idea that human rights have gone in a very short period of time from being an obscure concept in a couple of conferences in the 1920s and 30s to being this global phenomenon, this global theology that defines the way we think about politics of this conjunction of rights and human. That conjunction comes out of the Second World War and the, um, the terrible events of the, uh, that occurred in Nazi Germany. Marion, could we have the next slide there? Okay, I want to talk first about the role of film in the Nuremberg trials. Can I assume that everyone knows what the Nuremberg trials were? So after the Second World War, the Allied powers, that's uh, the United States, the Soviet Union, Britain and France, they got together. And well really, because France had been occupied, it was really the United States, Britain and the Soviet Union. They got together and they decided that they had to do something about the Nazis that they were captured. So many high-profile Nazis were 
prison, but with different approaches. Um, Churchill, British Prime Minister, said, just kill them. He just said, take them out the back, shoot them. Do not do anything more. Execute them. Um, Stalin wanted show trials, as we have in the Soviet Union. He wanted them put on trial, and so they would confess their guilt uh, in sort of fake trials. But it was the United States which played the winning card. And the United States said, no, what we want here are real trials. We want to really put these people on trial. That means we want to establish a statute of crimes and we want to examine the proper rules of evidence. We want to examine each of these accused and consider whether they have in fact committed those crimes. If they haven't committed those crimes, then they will. Now, why did the United States want this so much? Well, the United States argued that the crimes of the Nazis were so immense that you needed to create some kind of um, record for history to make sure that it didn't happen. That you needed to record for posterity who these people were and what they did. And the United States argued it one day. And a trial, a court was put together in the German city of Nuremberg. And what's interesting is that at that trial, cinema was present right from the beginning. Thank you. Thank you. I've been doing some research into this, and I've been uh, to some of the archives of the, of the trials. Um, and it's very interesting. The room that was chosen was chosen specifically because of its cinematic uh, uh, possibility. There was a place where you could set a camera, so you could, there were several cameras actually, you could film the whole proceedings. Uh, all the proceedings were recorded, and I'll show you a little clip of the, of the trials in a moment. Um, but cinematic techniques, the most advanced cinematic techniques of the day were used to record the trials. Now, we're used to seeing trials on TV, and we're used to seeing documentaries. Remember, 1947, 48, this was really new. Nothing like this had ever been seen before anywhere. This was absolutely radical. And the shape of the room that was used was set up so that the, the, um, the camera was facing directly on the accused, and there was another camera on the judges. So that's really what's, uh, what's, what's, what's going on here. And it, it was a remarkable uh, moment, I think, not just in legal history, but in cinematic history. It's the first time we see an international trial like this take, taking place. Nothing like this had ever been organized before. Certainly nothing like this had ever been filmed before. Mariam, could you play the first clip for me here? This is a clip from um, 1945, make it full size there, yeah. And this is a British newsreel of the Nuremberg trials. Have a look at this. Can we get volume on that?
sometimes it don't work here, obviously, they're in German. You can just see from that little clip there, it's very dramatic, isn't it? That you see uh, the Nazi leaders um, being asked to plead guilty or not guilty. One of them wants to make a statement. Uh, he's not allowed to make a statement. Um, and, we're, and, and the news really continues uh, about how he keeps trying to make a statement in the rest of the day, but he's not, he's not able to do so. This has been dramatized. This is the transformation of, let's say, documentary evidence into drama, the narrative. It's telling us a story. It's telling us a story about the character of the Nazi leaders, who they were, and what their motivations were. Even before we get to the judgments, we have a story. So I think that's very interesting. I think it tells us a lot about the role of film in human rights as it will be played on, played out later in the day. Um, but I think it's interesting to note that film was there right at the origin of human rights. And this moment, I would say, is the origin of human rights. 
This is where our human rights begins. It begins in Newark. Okay, Mari, can we, so I, I just go back one here. So I've described here the Nuremberg courtroom as a theater of global justice. That's really well. It's, it's, uh, it's trying to create a new system of international justice for posterity, for the future. Mari, let's go forward. Okay, so your first thought might be, okay, but, you know, Aaron, leave us alone, we're lawyers. We want to do law. Well, give us some tort law, some contract law. Why do you want to do this? Well, I would say, human rights are the parameters of legal thinking. They're embedded in how lawyers think and work and act. And I want you to go beyond the legal concepts to think about how human rights relate more broadly to culture. And as you'll see in the rest of the session, to cinematic culture in particular. So I think we've got to look beyond law to understand law. And I think if we're going to be human rights practitioners or activists, or we're going to deal with human rights, we've got to have a strong sense of what human rights are and where they come from. And I think film is important because we all watch movies. We all watch film. Film has an ideological appeal that perhaps no other medium has or indeed has ever had. And I think the ideological appeal of film is why human rights are so central to our legal culture and our uh, legal practices. Next one, Mark. Okay, so I'm jumping ahead to 1994. So far I've talked about the origin of human rights. Now I want to say a little bit about human rights In 1994, a, an organization was created called the International Human Rights Film Network. This is a network of film festivals around the world. There's currently 41 of them. Um, I've put the website here, which you can, I'll make the slides available. Look up the website. Uh, there's none, no regular uh, event in Pakistan, but in 2018 there was a Human Rights Through Cinematography Festival. Um, last year, uh, and these are film festivals organized in different countries around the world, presenting films relating to human rights. And this is, I think, a very interesting human rights movement that combines human rights with film. Um, but it has some obvious problems. One obvious problem of any kind of system of human rights film festival is that the people who go to film festivals are usually not the people that human rights films are about. Most human rights films are funded and made, it, made in economically advanced countries, uh, and they're often made about people living in economically less advanced countries. That's one of them. So there's a question of whose voice is speaking in human rights films. I think we've got to think about who's being represented. How are they being represented? So when we come to think about human rights films, and these are some of the questions that we need to ask. And even, let's say, within a country, let's say this event in Islamabad, I had a look at the, uh, at the program, um, I think even within countries themselves, there's also issues of, well, who goes to these film festivals? It's usually the economic elite anyway. It's usually going to be the liberal, kind of well-educated elite who goes to these festivals to watch movies about people who are less educated and less educated. We model schools, yeah. So there are problems, I think, in talking about human rights film festivals as a real human rights movement. But it's what we have. Okay? It's what we're stuck with. It's what I'm going to have a look at. So if we can just go to the next uh, slide here. The Human Rights Film Network has a charter, which I think is interesting. In 1994, like any human rights organization, it's got a charter and reads like a legal charter. I think it's quite weird, to be honest, that it has a legal charter. It's got articles, and each article lays out the principles of human rights film. What is a human rights film? What isn't a human rights film? So it says, Article 2 and 3, human rights films can be documentary, fiction, experimental, or animation. They may be harshly realistic or highly utopian. They may report, denounce, or convey an emotional message. 
Article 2 3 continues. We believe that human rights films, whatever their format, content, or character, should be truthful. That is, they should inform the viewers on human rights issues and aspirations, and should not intentionally misrepresent the facts or the views or words of those portrayed. They should not be so biased as to invoke hatred or discrimination against groups or individuals, or serve political or commercial interests alone. So this charter, this Human Rights Film Network Charter, relies on the fundamental idea that human rights film must be truthful. Here, I think, we're going to get into some sticky water. What do we mean by truth? Let's go to the next slide. Um, what do we mean by truth? Well, that is a tricky question. The Nuremberg Tribunal, for example, were concerned with being a documentary, uh, piece of documentary evidence in the future. But we can see that there's a clip I showed you that even in such a piece of documentary evidence, there's a narrative, there's a story. What's the truth? Is the truth the narrative, or is the truth the entire extent of the footage? What's the truth? So here we get into a certain amount of difficulty. What I notice is that in the films that are considered to be human rights films, they tend to be doc documentaries. Do the documentary format tends to be the dominant format. One writer has describe documentaries as explanatory, denunciatory, search, or testimonial. Let me explain this. He says that explanatory documentaries involve human rights, uh, exploring human rights through the question of through interviews, images, commentary, explaining human rights. A denunciatory documentary identifies responsibility for human rights abuses. A search documentary involves personal search for truth behind a particular human rights issue. And testimonial documentary bears witness to the experience of people affected by the abuse of human rights. This final one here, the testimonial document documentary, tends to be the documentary that tends to be most associated with truthfulness, um, with telling the truth. Can I go to the next slide, please? And the history of these documentaries very interesting. I, I don't have time to do it in much detail, but a lot of the influence on modern documentary making comes from a movement in France in the 1960s called Cinema Verité. And Cinema Verité is the idea that through um, the truth in cinema is revealed between the interaction between the filmmaker and the subject. So cinema verite, for example, would often involve um, the viewer seeing the film being made as it's made. So for example, the viewer seeing the cameras or the lights, uh, shaky cameras, yeah? bad angles, mistakes are left in in cinema verite. Uh, sometimes subjects are confronted and arguments ensue. I'm not edited out. The idea, the cinema verite, is that um, the interaction between filmmaker and subject is part of the truth. You can't sort of edit it out and imagine that the subject is speaking to a kind of blank canvas. And so this method was used in these two very famous documentaries about the Holocaust, A Night and Fog, and a six-hour documentary which interviewed uh, some of the perpetrators, some of the Nazi perpetrators, some of the victims of the Holocaust, uh, using cinema verite methods. And uh, it's really, I, 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 I think that documentary depictions of the genocide of the Holocaust are where our modern sense of human rights cinema really comes out. Can I go to the next slide? But there's a problem with documentary film as truth time. And that is that 
documentary film, like any kind of film, relies on conventions, using archive footage, using voiceovers, using particular filming styles, actually, cameras to convey truthfulness. And that we've got to take for granted that cinematic truth is not like legal truth. Human rights is not a cinematic concept, it's a legal concept with legal standards of proof. And it's very important not to conflate the legal meaning of human rights with the concept of truthfulness in human rights cinema. So cinema, even documentary cinema, involves a cinematic interpretation of events. There's no possibility of cross-questioning witnesses, challenging the underlying uh, uh, concepts uh, that, that are at stake. It's a different register of truth. We should never conflate it. Uh, can I go to the next slide? Next one again? Yeah, okay. So that brings me to another kind of human rights that we see on Consumer Arts Film Network um, to a lesser extent. And these are feature films. Again, the charter says they must be defined in relation to truth. But how can a feature film be related to truth? How do we know where truth ends and the feature film begins? Where does the story begin? Where does truth end? So, for example, some of the classics of human rights feature films might be films like Hotel Rwanda or The Killing Fields. Anybody familiar with these? Yeah. I've yeah. seen them. You've seen Hotel Rwanda. So Hotel Rwanda, it's about the Rwandan genocide. It's about a hotel manager who is um, trying to shield people from the Rwandan genocide. And it's become a sort of classic of human rights film. It's a regular movie. That's it. I don't think about it's probably the movie. The hotel manager is based on a real person. The point about Hotel Rwanda is that it looks real. It's meant to look real. It's about real people. It adopts in its style ultra-realism. And most human rights films are realistic in their aesthetic. Why? Because realism looks like truth. Realism looks more believable than pure fiction. So some people call it a, a mockumentary a mixture of, let's say, documentary with fiction, uh, so we call it faction, a mixture of fact with fiction, but it's the idea that the style of human rights feature films tends to be ultra-realistic. Why? Because it needs to convey the human rights message in a way that looks truthful. Not saying it's got to be truthful, but it's got to look truthful. I once wrote about this as truthiness. They don't look truthy. Yeah? Uh, so truthiness, I think, is different from truthfulness. It's the sense of being truthful rather than actually being truthful. But feature films are fiction. They're really based on fact, but they're a dramatization, they're a fiction. They can never really be the thing itself. And neither can documentary. So there is a problem, I think trying to define human rights cinema in terms of its relation to truth. Even though that seems like a very logical way to define it, it still ends up being problematic. Let me show you how one famous movie resolves this issue. This issue. Um, and this is a 1961 film, perhaps the most important uh, uh, human rights film of the early period, it's called Judgment at Nuremberg. Again, it's on Nuremberg, you can see. If you can just pause it there a second, Mary. Um, this is very upsetting, by the way, so if you're easily upset, maybe you don't watch this. Uh, it's very disturbing footage. The story is, this is a feature film. And it's a feature film about, some, about a Nazi jurist, a Nazi judge, who's put on trial. Fictional story. Okay? And in the trial, he defends himself. He said he was acting in accordance with his professional values. Professional values said he had to be loyal to the state. 
He was. He's not a monster, but he was loyal to the state. And, but yet, he cooperates with the Nazi party and he sends a method, uh, say the woman, to be executed. Yeah. Um, so he's put on trial. And in the middle of the trial, uh, the, 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 the drama is around the judge, who's played by Spencer Tracy. You can see him in the You might recognize him from all American black and white movies. And he's got the side on the guilt, or otherwise, of the Nazi jurors. And the film has had these, actually, very brilliant uh, set piece standards, which each legal argument is presented. And it's not, by no means a simple uh, case. But there is an argument on each side. Nazi judge is saying he was doing what his profession required him to do, and the prosecutor is saying what he did was uh, violated every law of nature. Judge responds, of course, that he's not bound by the laws of nature, he's bound by the laws of the state. Okay. Now, in the middle of the trial, of the trial uh, towards the end, judge is left there, and he's trying to decide what to do. But the prosecutor shows this clip, and it's a clip of actual footage from the liberation of the concentration camps. Now, what we see here, we see the clip that's shown, it's five minutes long. But we also see the judge watching the clip. And we see the different characters in the court watching the clip. Now, there's an interesting intersubjectivity here because it's not just about us watching the clip or us watching the movie. We're watching the court watching the clip. So, what's truthful here, what we see, is that for the court, it's the clip that's truthful. Yeah? It's the documentary evidence that's truthful, we're watching the court, watching the truth. Yeah. So let's have a look at this. Uh, but when you watch it, uh, later on in the thing, try to watch how the camera uh, uh, moves from the clip to the protagonist of the film, and how we watch them watch. Okay, have a look at this. Yeah. 
Okay, so you get the idea. The important thing there is that it's, I, I did say there were very disturbing scenes, but it, the important thing, a couple of, I, I, I think that clip is, uh, if you like, the quotescence of human rights cinema. Why? Because it embraces both feature film and documentary. It prioritizes documentary above feature film. And it's about us watching the watching. This is not just about us watching something, but we're watching the act of judgment. And also, it's about one judge judging another judge. So I think this, in a way, this piece of film, uh, and this movie in particular, is the quintessential human rights movie. OK, can we go on to the next uh, uh, slide? And I'm going a little late now, and you're probably dying heat and exhaustion. OK, so where, where are we from this? I think we can't rely on documentary film as a simple marker of truth. We can't conflate legal judgment with aesthetic judgment. And the human rights film charter assumes a simple but false equivalence between the two. Mario, can we move on? What can lawyers learn from human rights cinema? One, not the documentary form and legal evidence are you know, not equivalent, but that they both rely on the compelling power of narrative to convey horror. And they both have the power to shape what we think about this. This is where they meet. Can I go on to the next slide here? So I think in terms of where we are now, um, I think this connection between human rights and cinema is more important than ever. Why? Because of the rise of citizen journalism, the fact that you no longer need a film crew to make a movie. You can make a movie with your phone if you don't have them. There's a great little film here called Five Broken Cameras, a Palestinian film from 2012. Uh, you can watch it here online. And it's a story about a Palestinian village uh, under occupation. And it, it's the story of a journalist in this town who, whose five cameras get broken in different uh, encounters with the Israeli army. Brilliant little film. And it's a classic example of, of citizen journalism. And it's also about someone who's actually from the town. Someone who's from, he's not representing somebody else, he's representing his own world, which I think is, is quite an important point. Um, so I think for uh, film, a very important role in human rights activism, draw attention to human rights abuses, it can complement litigation, it can complement other legal strategies. I take an example here of this film, Taxi to the Dark Side, in 2008. You might have seen this, it's about, um, sorry, thank you, about the um, murder of detainees by the Americans in Afghanistan. Uh, very good documentary film, but it was um, produced at the same time as there were legal actions taking place in the United States to prosecute some of those responsible for killing detainees in Afghanistan. And both the film, uh, the, the film be, because it was in a way coterminous with the, uh, uh, with the, um, uh, the litigation, they fed into each other, really, in the terms of changing people's opinions about what the Americans were doing in Afghanistan. However, I think film also has the potential to be highly partial, to be polarizing, to be subject to manipulation, especially now, in a period where political opinions are more divided than any time I can remember, and where the criterion of truth is more contested than ever. If you watch YouTube, you find plenty of documentaries that are simply not true. Uh, it's easier to make movies, but it's also easier to manipulate people into life. So I said that truth is a problematic criterion. It's also more contested than ever. Okay, let me go to the final slide and finish up before you die of exhaustion and heat. Uh, Mariam, I just want to quickly mention this uh, very strange movie here, uh, 2012, that I've written about. Um, it's a 
film called The Act of Killing. And I think that this film resolves some of the issues. I'll get this out of the way. You can let it run there in the background. Uh, it resolves some of the issues that I've talked about in terms of truth of documentary and human rights film. The film concerns a, um, a genocide that took place, not genocide, a mass killing that took place in Indonesia in 1965 on the island of Sumatra, where um, government militias rounded up anybody they thought was a communist and they killed. Um, and often it was used to settle disputes, uh, kind of uh, get even with other people, also to uh, target the Chinese population in Indonesia. And it's, right, it's estimated that hundreds of thousands of people died in these killings. No one's ever been prosecuted, and it's kind of forgotten killing, forgotten event. The filmmaker here goes to Indonesia and he lives on this island for a while. And he finds some of the perpetrators. And he tells the perpetrators that he's making a movie about their exploits, about the killings, to celebrate them. And he asks, do they want to be involved in this movie project? And they all say yes. And these guys were gangsters. They were local mobsters, gangsters who worked for the government in 1965 and were quite happy to kill people in large numbers. And they were very proud of what they did. We're talking about mass killing, people being rounded up with no trial and being murdered in the night. And so the filmmaker says to them, well, would you be interested in recreating your killings? And they said, yes, we would. We'd like to do that. They were all, as I said, mobsters started their careers selling uh, cinema tickets, counterfeit cinema tickets. And they were all big movie fans. And so they started reenacting their murders in the style of a gangster movie, a western, a musical. And so what you have here is a film that is a human rights film in one sense, in the sense that it concerns human rights across it's not a documentary. It doesn't represent anything truthfully. In fact, when you watch the movie, if you watch the movie, you don't know what's really happening most of the time. You know what's real and what's fiction. You watch some events and you think, this is so terrible, it's got to be real, and then you discover it's fiction. And yet the most fictionalized events are the most disturbing ones. So for example, there's a fictional moment where uh, there's a musical scene where one of the gangsters, the gangsters are singing about their exploits, about the people they murder. And an actor comes up to one of the murderers and he says, I want to thank you for killing me. And he accepts a medal to thank him for killing the victim. And in other scenes, the, um, we have more documentary style filmmaking where the murderers talk about how they kill people with piano wire and how to how to best you know how to, how best to murder someone with piano wire and how to avoid getting blood in your pants, you know, wear dark clothing and so on. And the most horrific discussions. But I thought what was interesting about the film was that it does something that I'd never seen before in a movie. It deals with truth in a way that I've never seen before by fictionalizing truth in a way that is more truthful than documentary. This is truth structured as fiction rather than truth structured as truth. So I'm going to show you the trailer for the movie. And I would suggest that you have a look at it. However, again, I would say it's a deeply disturbing film. Not because it shows you anything real. A moment ago, we saw some horrific scenes from the liberation of you don't see real horror, but everything you see is fictionalized, but in a way it's more disturbing because there is something about it that reveals an inner truth about these horrors. So have a look at the trailer and let's end the session. Now, Mario, can you play that? So these are the three guys.
all of this is fictionalized. Right? Very weird film. I would strongly recommend it, and it should change the way you think about human rights and so I'm going to leave it there. Is there anything you'd like to say? I know I've spoken for far too long. Sometimes I need to be told to shut up. Thank you so much. <laughs>